All right, greetings everyone. My name is Marcus Benjamin, CEO and founder of a and Career Consulting. And I have the pleasure of um, spending some time with Dr. Derek Skeet. Um, he is a professor at Medgar Evers College. Um, you know, a great guy, I've known him for a couple of years, um, have a lot of respect for him, you know, and for him taking some time, as you can see, he, he's well relaxed and, um, you know, Despite for him taking the time to, to come and have a conversation with us is, is just um, priceless. So, um, Derek, welcome. Thank you, Marcus. I greatly appreciate um, you know, your kind introduction. Thank you. Well, you deserve it. You earned that, right? You earned that doctor. Nobody didn't give it to you, right? I know some people get the doctorate, hand it to them, but you actually earned it. <laughs> you have to earn it, yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so we're going to spend a little bit of time today um, getting to know who, who Dr. Derek Skeet is and, you know, spend some time as it pertains to career identification and, um, you know, kind of get some input and some insight from you um, as it pertains to your career um, as a professor over these last, um, how many years? About 20 years. 20? Yes, sir. All right, so 20 plus years, so a well-seasoned um, <laughs> professor here, uh, seen a lot, done a lot, and um, you know, had an opportunity to really impact a lot of students' lives um, over his 20 plus years career as a professor. So thank you again for joining us today. And um, just gonna ask you like a simple couple of questions and then we will just roll from there. No That's fair? I'm good. All right. So, Dr. Derek Skeet. Um, so, as far as career identification, when did you realize that being a professor and getting into the the field of academia? When when did you realize that that is something you wanted to do? Well, that's an excellent question because I didn't want to become a professor. To be quite frank, that would be honest. <laughs> you know, because all along the way, um, my intention was to become an engineer. And I did study engineering at Penn State, but that was what I was considered. What my interest really was the direction of focus that I had. So undergrad, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. And then I ventured into pursuing an undergraduate degree in mathematical physics with the intention that I would use that as a platform to spring into engineering. Now, if I'm to just back up one second, I started electrical engineering program at City College, but I just didn't like it. Just wasn't fascinating to me. So hence the reason why I switched into mathematical physics. And um, at Penn State, they had a program in an engineering program in environmental pollution control, where of course most of your class, your coursework, were engineering courses, and um, that's what I did. So that was really quite interesting. Um, and from that, I ended up pursuing environmental science. And the reason being is simply because I was at a conference in 1994 at Georgia Tech. And I was listening to some presenters who were speaking about, you know, career pathways, et cetera. And, um, you know, as a young up and coming professional, I was thinking in terms of what does, what career pathway can I really get into? So I asked a simple question, which of course the panelists were somewhat, I did, I'm not gonna use the word befuddled, but they were somewhat hesitant in responding. So I, I said, with all of the science that you guys have studied, what is in place as a conveyor, as a conduit between science and policy? And literally, they had nothing because they were just straight scientists. You don't want environmental scientists, chemists, mathematicians, biologists. So they were just on the street and the science well. So that kind of forced me to think differently in terms of what career pathway. I wanted to pursue because recognizing that there was so this synergy between science and policy. And that was, mo that was along the line that my, where my interests lie. Hence the reason why I ended up pursuing the environmental science because of my exposure and I saw the synergy between the two. Okay. All right. So Dr. Ski, may I ask you, um, given that you, your original plan wasn't to get into academia and being um, a professor and, and you know that whole um, the whole process do you how do you feel today do you feel that 
that decision you made 20 plus years ago, sitting where you are today, what would you say about that decision? I think it was the decision for me because sometimes, you know, as young professionals, we may think we know what we want. We may think that what we, we want to do is exactly what we should be doing. But I don't think I would have been any happier doing any other thing than what I'm doing right now, which is feeding hungry minds. And I took that quote from one of my mentors who, you know, he would always say to us when he come to class, he came to class to feed hungry minds. And I adopted that quote and as mine. I told him and I continue to use it all the time. So for me, it's all about feeding hungry minds because getting into teaching really allowed me to see from a first-hand perspective what it's like to inform students and to help them to become the best that they can be. And I think that um, from my perspective, as from someone who did almost all of the science, fundamental science courses, it allows me to really be in a position to help students, whether they're doing chemistry, physics, math, or biology, because of course, of my experience in all of the different areas. However, I would say that um, it just, it led me now to having a better understanding of the process. It led me to having a better understanding of the students and the student need. So you find that I'm in a position where I can advise them and I'm in a position where I can mentor them as well as I'm in a position where I can teach them. So I think I get the best of all worlds by being able to advise, mentor, and teach students as a professor as opposed to if I was in any other position where I could have probably mentored them close or far, but I don't think I would have been in a position to really teach them fundamentally and help them to become the best that they can be. Okay, thank you for sharing. Um, so we know when it comes to career and career path and everything, no, we can safely say that a lot of people are in a job or in a career path that they really don't enjoy, right? And going to work is a task and it becomes work, right? Whereas if it's a career path that you, you enjoy doing, then it becomes, I, wouldn't, I, I don't want to say like a hobby, but it becomes something that is, huh? It is, it is a, a hobby on a vocation because it doesn't feel like work. Someone said to me, right, I, don't right. work this. I don't work. I enjoy what I do to the extent where it's like a hobby. So you, 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 you're right. You hit the nail on the head. It's not work. It's a hobby. And I enjoy doing it. Right. Okay. Thank you. So you pretty much work in the chemistry and environmental science department. And I'm sorry? Yes, I do. Okay. So I just want to, um, you know, just bring a question to you concerning, you know, the environment, especially with everything that's going on. Do you see um, a clear career path for a lot of students who are in college and might be thinking about something, you know, that where they can have a great impact, not only within their community, but you know, uh, from a wider scope as it pertains to the world and what little they can do to help change course as it pertains to the environment and global warming and, you know, all the different shifts that we have seen over the last couple of years. You know, what, you know, given that you are in that field, what can you share with, with the viewers? You know, it might be students who might be watching what can you share with them as pertains to a career in that direction and the impact they can have on, on society and, and the world at large? I think this is probably one of the best times for any student who have interest in environmental science for them to pursue a pathway. Now, in the past, when people think of environmental science, they just think of advocacy or, or tree huggers. Now, that has long changed. This, this still has its place, be mindful. It has a space because there must be um, individuals who are concerned about the environment to the extent where they would agitate. Now, having said that, there are pathways for students currently who, are, who may have interest in environmental science. There are pathways through industry. There are pathways through state and city governments that they can you know, pursue as the case would be. So whether or not someone decides to go industry, or decide to work for state or city, there are opportunities that exist for them. And I think, especially for African-American and Hispanic students, for the most part, who seems to be somewhat reluctant to pursue a, a career or a degree in environmental science because, 
for the lack of knowledge. Now, there are so many environmental issues right now, or there are so many different pathways that one can pursue when it comes to environmental science. So, for example, a number of students in our program uh, pursue occupational health, right? Because under the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, occupational health is an area of concern that almost every establishment must have some sort of post officer in place. So that's one thing what students do. What, there's also safety and compliance that students can participate in, students can become certified as, as um, CSP, Certified Safety Professionals. In occupational safety, they become certified and certified industrial hygienists, which right. is, I mean, as a CSP or CIH, I would say that the starting salary there, after completing a degree with the certification, they can be somewhere upwards of the 70, 80, 90,000 dollars. And of course, with experience, that number is just going to jump up, right? Once you have those certifications, those are considered to be somewhat premium certifications in the process. Hold one second, let me just plug my charger in. Okay. And while um, Dr. Skeet um, is taking care of um, that's a little technical stuff there. We, you know, um, oh, he's back. Okay. I'm back. I'm All right. Back. So I'll give you back the platform. I'm back. So I'm All right. that as a certified industrial hygienist or certified safety professional, that's considered to be some of the premier type of um, certification that students can take advantage of. And of course, they can be gainfully employed. Now, a student need not have a degree in environmental science to be employed in the arena because there are other certification courses that he or she can take and, of course, be able to still, still uh, um, be gainfully employed, right? Someone could be certified in asbestos handling. Someone could be certified in um, um, water quality, air quality. Um, and there's a whole plethora of hazardous waste management of areas that students can become, get certification right. and still be gainfully employed without a degree, by the way. Be mindful. Now, environmental science, I mean, and environmental issues is a wide open field. Now, because environmental science is a juxtaposition of chemistry, physics, math, biology, you find then that some people may say it's not a real science, but it's a combination of all of the above, right? right. The issues that one can deal with, one can focus on environmental health. Environmental health is, a area, is a large area in which you have a lot of opportunities where jobs are readily available as well. As a, uh, a health inspector, one can become a health inspector and one can build his or her way from, from that position. On construction sites, one can be a safety specialist, right? And of course, you get your certification. That also is an, a, a pathway. So, of course, I can identify, at which I've done thus far, many different pathways that students can pursue when it comes to the issue of environmental science. I haven't even touched on policy, right? And policy is another right. area that students can participate in. And to add to the policy aspect of it, if they want to pursue a degree in, in environmental law, which can then make them to become a policy analyst. One can become a forecaster, right? Because, I mean, you have environmental issues such as global warming, greenhouse effect. That's another area in which they can get involved. In fact, my colleague and I from um, Bronx Community College, this past um, December, we took some students to um, Australia, Tongsville, Australia, where we partnered with the city of Tongsville and we did some backpack research, we did some air quality research, and the students had fun doing it. This right. summer, at the end of the month, we taken students to, to, to India. We we're gonna do a, a, a similar research project. And that's a CUNY-wide project with Medgevers College, you know, York, Browns Community College, um, Lehman College, LaGuardia Community College. So we are going to do a, a, a city, no, sorry, we're going to do a CUNY-wide project with students in Mumbai, India, coming up at the end of this month. So, and, and it's, it's, again, it's opportunities that's exposing the students who are doing real-time research on environmental issues, and in this case, it's air quality. Next week, Monday, the 15th of July, one of my colleagues, Dr. Shen, he's taking a group of students to, to China where we're doing some, some water quality research. So again, those are other areas that students can become specialists in, they can right. get uh, involved with. And of course, the opportunities exist for them to get jobs right upon graduation with either 
They're from, again, if you look at the city state, Department of Environmental Protection, Department of Environmental Conservation, or the Environmental Protection Agency, which right. again is opportunities that exist for students from a governmental perspective. So, so if going to India and China, I mean, you know, watching documentaries and so forth, I haven't been to those countries yet, but looking at documentaries and looking at some of the challenges that they are facing as far as their environment is concerned and how that impacts the economy, the economics of the country on a whole. I mean, it's, 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 it, it, it impacts everything. As you mentioned, the breeding quality and then, you know, so I think that's a great opportunity for students, you know, to, to, to have the opportunity to go into those environment and, you know, as you mentioned, test the air, the water, test for pollution, and see how that go into um, the groundwater yeah. and how it impacts groundwater quality and everything. Now, I'm not, I'm not big on, I, have, I didn't go to school for environmental science, but, you know, I think, um, it, you know, using good common sense and, you know, looking at research and so forth, when you have that level of, um, that level of pollution, right, in the water system that then get into the water table, you know, and then make it to, to humans, human beings as, form, as a form of drinking water, it really, really could impact, especially little kids and babies and so forth. Absolutely. So from both a, a water quality and an air quality perspective, people can be impacted because from a water perspective, you have runoff from farms. Which right. To the um, the surface water, and then you have from underground, you have the groundwater, which can be contaminated with pollutants like arsenic and and other heavy metals, which can become a potential problem. And of course, right now we do have a problem with leaking underground storage tanks, which is addressed on the yeah uh, big uh, issue. That's a huge issue. Big issue that we have from storage tanks of of, of gasoline pipelines and other types of um um. um I would say pollutants that gets into the body of water. From an air quality perspective, look, we had Alaska, for example. This past week here, Alaska had at least four to five days where the temperature has eclipsed 80 degrees, right? And now wow. what's happening up in Alaska? But because we live in, in, in New York City on the East Coast, we, we start to pay attention to what is taking place in places like Alaska, but that Alaska to me is like the canary in the tunnel. Now, what has happened over the years with the melting of the glaciers, melting of the ice in the Bering Sea, it meant then that there is more, that there is water, warm water, that's in the Bering Sea you now, that's bringing that moisture onto the landmass. So therefore, they get in the, um, the warm air, which means the temperature stays warm. In addition right. to the, uh, right. the jet stream that is dipping in the northern part of the, of the, of the state, which allows for the cold, for the, for the, for the warmer air, to remain trapped in the northern region of the state. Hence the reason why they get these extended days of 80 plus degrees. Now, this past spring also had a temperature eclipse 90 degrees, right? Again, which is, I wouldn't say it is a customary for them, but especially in the springtime and the, and the summertime, for them to have four straight days of 80 plus degrees is somewhat not quite common. I just right. heard from Europe. And Europe experienced a heat wave in the last week and a half, right? With the temperature in some places were above uh, 100 degrees. So across the globe, we are seeing where the temperature is, 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 is increasing because we know that has happened over the last um, 25, 30 years. We've seen that happen. Right. So it's gonna, the question one should ask oneself is, what is the economic impact of temperature increase? Of course, you know, people running ACs, so the energy budget is in, increased. People running fans, the energy budget is increased. People taking showers, more showers, so which means the water budget increases. So there's a cost factor associated with climate change. And God forbid, when you have um, disasters, the billions of dollars that's involved in repair and to get places back into a normal state is also a problem. So we should be concerned about the environment, we should be very much concerned about environmental issues because it's going to affect us. And I ask the question, if not here, then where? 
we have absolutely nowhere to go. If we look at that, we saw in the Caribbean where there were issues in terms of um, the hurricane and hurricane season. That right. region, for example, they were impacted. Now, my question is, are the Caribbean countries, as we speak, ready for the, the level of disaster that took place last year? Puerto Rico was affected. Dominica, Antigua, St. Lucia. Yeah, yeah. Down the list. St. So Martin. Do they have a policy, an environmental policy, for climate change in the Caribbean? And of course, we do know then that a lot of these what we refer to as SIDS, small island development states, are going to be impacted greatly by right. the onset of um, storms, hurricanes, the frequency of them, and it can be devastating. So studying environmental science and with a focus on, on any of the areas, I think is an opportunity for students to really begin to make a big difference in their lives. I mean, that that's amazing. Um, you know, as far as all these things that are going on um, in the environment and in our world, you know, and I think, you know, listening from you, um, based on what you, you shared with us, there is a lot of opportunities, you know, for students who are in college to get into the environmental science field and, you know, and one, go into it because you want to make a difference, right? And it's because it's something that you love doing, you know, a great opportunity, especially in the time, in the times that we live in now, you know, I think it's, we need more of the, the, the young students who go into college to kind of filter into this field, you know, where one, they can make a living for themselves and then they could, you know, definitely have that impact, um, as far as contributing to to cause to, to some of the healing that is um, well needed. So, Dr. Skeet, I know we can continue all night. Um, I think your video disappeared. Okay, there we go. There we go. We can. I know we can go on all night because this is a very very interesting topic. And you know, as far as um, everything that's going on, um, I think you laid out a, a, a strong case for a lot of um, students, and I know you do it every single day with your students in your class, um, in your classes, you know, encouraging them and, and highlighting the importance of, you know, being in the environmental science field. So if you can, if you can just, uh-huh. Let me say one more thing to you along this line. Now, for example, students who want to go to medical school, dental school, um, pharmacology school, etc. They can also pursue a degree in environmental science because what is going to happen is going to, is going to make them, it's going to separate them from the traditional student who may pursue right. biology. So you can still pursue a degree in environmental science and apply to medical school. You can still pursue a degree in environmental science and apply to dental school. And that's what I've been trying to encourage some students to, to give themselves more option, right? Because let's say, for example, they may have a gap here in a, application for med medical school or dental school. But with a degree in environmental science, you can still get some level of employment during that process if right. you want to use your degree to work for you while you want to pursue your, your medical or your dental degree. So um, it's, it's a way outside of the traditional role. And of course, it gives students an opportunity to be looked at differently as opposed to looked at from the traditional perspective of pursuing a degree in biology. So, that's another way in which I also encourage students to participate and pursue um, environmental science, even though it may not be an area of focus for them as when it pertains to career pathway. All right. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, if, if you can um, just, you know, make an appeal to students to, you know, to kind of encourage them, you know, encourage them, you know, so one, take the time to identify, especially when you're coming out of high school and you're getting into college in your freshman year, you know, to really spend some time trying to figure out, well, okay, in the next four years, after I graduate, where do I want to go? Where do I want to be, right? Um, where I'm at right now, am I making the right choice in terms of, um, uh, uh, you know, a degree part? You know, or, or should I really kind of look at big picture scenarios to see if if what I'm doing or the direction in which I'm getting into 
if that's the most ideal for them for 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 them at that point so i mean if you can just share a little bit on that for our viewers okay so correct is very very important and i would say that every student or every listener when it comes to career identification you have to be clear and honest with yourself you have to be clear as to, as to your strengths you have to be clear as to your weaknesses at the same time you may identify an area so in the strengths and weaknesses you should have an idea as to what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are. And your objective is to convert your weaknesses into strengths. Now, at the same time now, you may have an area of interest that, you know, you want to get into. In looking at that area of interest, don't just look at it in a vacuum. You look at that area of interest with an eye open to what is the trajectory for that area of interest over the next five years, over the next 10 years. Is that area of interest something that I can see myself working in in the next right. five, next 10 years, which is very important. Hence, the reason why you have to be honest with yourself. And thirdly, how does my strength fit in to that area of interest that I have? Because more, many a times, that's what you need to be able to help you in those areas. So you choose a path. You're not just choosing a path just because it sounds good or it looks good. You're choosing it because you believe that, that you can make a difference. You add value to that particular field and the trajectory for it is, is upward over the next five, 10 years as the case would be. Because if not, you may do something that you don't like, you're not passionate about, and eventually you may just find yourself midstream realizing that's not what you want to do. Right. Or sometimes it can be somewhat difficult in starting over or changing course. So yeah. again, just to recap, your strengths and weaknesses are the first two things you look at. Second, how can I convert my weaknesses into strengths? Very important. Thirdly, you look at you know, a career pathway that you may have interest in. Fourthly, ask yourself, what does the future look like for this interest that I have? And fifth, you say to yourself, how does my strengths fit in into that um, uh, interest that I have? And last but not least, do I have passion for... Right this uh, uh, current path that I'm choosing. And if you are to be honest with yourself in all of those areas, I think you would find yourself having a very healthy career pending um, any other type of obstacles that we meet along the way. But from a perspective of you having love, joy, passion, and having the right, the requisite skill set needed for that career pathway, I think you should be well on your way to becoming very successful and happy in what you do. Right. And I think the, um, that word passion, is is so um, instrumental uh, because that can make that can be the difference in what you what you want to do becoming a um, you know work or becoming hobby, yes. right? That passion, right? And and I mean you hit some some real key points about being honest with yourself and well, that's one of the things a lot of people are not uh, or they fail to 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 be honest with themselves, you know, and to ask themselves those tough questions. And do that um, deep um, soul search, and and to look look themselves in the mirror and say, hey, you know, is this something that I really want to do? Is this something I really enjoy? You know, so you you hit it pretty much on its head, you know. So, Doctor Skeet, um, just want to thank you, thank you for taking some time out of your 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 night. Well, we're doing this interview at night here, so um, there's. I know, I know you had a long day and, you know, your commitment to, to sharing and to, to make sure that, you know, students across the world or anyone that watch, watches this video, you know, that they can be inspired and to get some knowledge and some information, you know, to make some, make the right decision for themselves. So, you know, um, before we go, I don't know if you have any last words um, before, before we close it out. Well, I can say several things, but if, if you don't mind, I'm going to make a plug for myself. Okay. A book that's coming out within the next month is called Breaking the Chains of Self-Doubt, um, which basically is for, for students mainly, but of course, parents can also get uh, information out of the book as well, because I have two chapters dedicated to the parents, and um, it's basically some of my stories, some anecdotes from my personal journey. And of course, other people's as well, other persons as well, where I was able to learn from them and of course, allow the, the reader to learn from some of the experiences and what it took in order to become successful. Because quite often, 
when it comes to success, people may look on the outside and think, well, someone became successful because they're lucky, they're fortunate, they're born with a gold spoon. Right. What they don't see is the process. And understanding the process and fall in love with the process is what gets one where one needs to be. Because think of, think of the journey that you've been through. Think of the journey that anybody been through for that moment. When you think in terms of wanting to become successful, there's a wide chasm that exists between where you are and where you want to go. Now, to get there, it simply means that you must have a plan. And that plan must be a working plan that you, at, in every day, doing some level of work to get towards that, um, that goal that you have set for yourself. Let's say, for example, someone is attempting to cross the street from one, one side of the street to the next. If you stand where you're standing, you never would be able to get across the street. But the minute you begin to walk, whether you take right. steps or giant steps, you will get across the street. And that's the same thing when it comes to career. That's the same thing when it comes to goals. You cannot just expect to be static and achieve to achieve your goal. To achieve your goal, you must have a dynamic process in place, which, it, which I, I say is a plan that is working, a workable plan. And of course, along the way, you're going to be doing some, some change into it. But eventually it's going to get you towards that goal that you set for yourself. And I think that the book, Breaking the Chains of Self-Doubt, has a lot of information that individuals can get something out of and it can help them along the way. I would like to come back at another time for us. To have Most definitely. You know, you, you pick my brain because I was about to, I was about to, um, to put out on the table uh, the invitation to, for you to come back and you know, share with us um, a little more about the book because that's listening to, that's the, the, the title alone, you know, it, um, it seems like it's something that would be exciting. Yeah, yeah. and it, as far as career pathway, self-doubt is also a, a, an inhibitor, a natural inhibitor, unfortunately, that people put on themselves. Right. I'm not realizing it because, and of course, some, you may have heard the term, the imposter syndrome. And that's also part of the self-doubt that, uh, people allow themselves to be morphed into that space so they don't think that they belong. They don't think they, think they can do it. They don't think that they're good enough. They don't think that they have the skill set. But right. you have to break that chain, break that self-doubt in, in order for you to realize your goal, realize your potential, and be the best that you can be. And how would it happen? It would happen by you understanding self, reflecting, having a goal, finding your passion, and being able to execute accordingly. And of course, last but not least, I would say that what was instrumental in helping me to get clarity on my goal and where I was going was having good mentors. And mentorship right. is very, very important when it comes to the process as well. So I would say that anybody now who is seeking out or who is now an upstart, or even if you're changing career, find yourself a mentor, someone who you can trust, someone you can talk to, someone who can guide you because believe it or not, it helps. And you may have more than one mentor as well, but it's in essence, it helps. So in closing, I would say you must know yourself. You must understand yourself. You must have some focus with respect to what it is you want to do. And last but not least, you must become more resilient because when the going gets tough, you must have a plan in which how you're going to stay the course to achieve yeah. that. Because when it's all said and done, we're not expecting your pathway to be linear. We do know that it's going to be and the curves, going to have hills, bumps, of course, but you have to know how to navigate that process in order for you to achieve that goal. So resilience is very important as well. So it's doable. I did it. You did it. Many others did it. Many others like us did it. Many others who came after us did it. Some are currently doing it. So to everyone, you can do it. And when it comes to career pathways, it's a serious discussion that one needs to have with self, a serious discussion that one can have with a mentor is a serious discussion one can have with a coach. And I would also say then that it is very important for one to get a coach, someone who understands the terrain, someone who can guide the right. videos on the process as simple as writing a resume, keywords and phrases in, in a resume, as simple as having a LinkedIn profile, as you and I would discuss from time to time, which is very important as well. Most people may not understand that, may not recognize it, which sometimes can, can, can be a hindrance. So right. a correct coach is 
very important in the process. And if I was 18, 19, 20 years of age, and I was going through the process again, I would have gotten myself a coach. If I was at a stage where I was changing career, I would have gotten myself a career coach because I see the importance and the value in it. And to everyone right. that's listening right now, I am saying here to you, a career coach is a worthy investment because it helps you, it gives you the edge, it gives you the insider's viewpoint, the insider's uh, lens as far as career pathways and the guidance to get in that job and to make a difference in terms of the salary you may get versus someone who may not have that, that, that insider's lens uh, available to them. All right, well said. Well, Dr. Skeet, it was a pleasure again, man. And now, um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Great conversation. And I hope uh, the viewers who, who, who um, take the time to, to watch the entire video really get a lot of information and get some insight and feel encouraged. All right, feel encouraged, you know, and, and you know, assess themselves and make sure that they, they put themselves and give themselves the best opportunity to be, to be successful. Um, so as we close off, I want to just thank you again. And um, when that book is ready, please make sure you, you keep in contact with me because I'm going to bring you back on and we're going to do our, um, our next we'll do our interview on it. You know, kind of give you an opportunity to share a little bit about the book. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to hearing uh, more about it. And um, I make sure I get my copy. You sure will. A signed <laughs> copy. <laughs> <Sign> copy. <laughs> a signed copy in advance. It, so that when we have the discussion, maybe some things out of the book, you may want to ask me a couple of questions. I'll be happy to answer it. So what really triggered, you know, the, the, the writing? What were some of the thought processes that went right. into it and why? I was able to write what I wrote. All right. Come back and discuss it. Sounds like a plan. We have a deal. All right. All thank right, everyone, much. thank you. Yes, we will. We will. All right, everyone, thank you. My name is Marcus Benjamin, um, CEO, founder of a and Career Consulting. Um, if you have any needs and you, you're trying to get your resume updated, you're trying to get your LinkedIn profile uh, refined, or you, you're trying to get one going because you don't have one, um, please visit our website. It's www.amcareerconsulting.com. You can email us at careerteam at amcareerconsulting.com. Our number is 347-248-5727. Thank you again, Dr. Skeet. Everyone have a great night, and we will keep in touch. Make sure you subscribe to keep, in, um, you know, keep updated with all the, the videos that are coming down the line soon. So thank you again. You have a great night, Mr. Or Dr. Skeet. I can't call you Mr. anymore. <laughs> I know we go way back, but I got to give I you that know. title. <laughs> That's so it's earned. It's earned. We good. We good. All right, all right, Dr. Skeet. You have a great night, and um, thank you again. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Have a good one. Yes, okay, bye. Bye-bye.